ਅਕਾਲ ਮੂਰਤ the word akal murat is broken up into two words akal kal is a sanskrit word and it means time but it also means death when you put a in front of anything it is the negation of that word so kal meaning death kal meaning time akal meaning not that not death no time so if something has no death and something has no time you could say it is unlimited in every way it's unrestricted in every way it cannot end murat means form the word murat has a sihari at the end we talked about spelling last time previously all the words that we've seen in the mool mantar have had an ankar underneath and the ankar represents a singular word and it represents a masculine word remember we saw the word sat naam naam being a masculine word in english that's difficult to understand because we don't have the system of masculine and feminine words a chair is a chair a table is a table but in lots of other languages including the indian languages including french and other languages for example everything has to be given a male or a female characteristic so naam even if you're female you will never say meri naam you will say meri naam So the word naam is masculine and in bani that is identified with an ankar underneath a masculine word a feminine word is written with a sihari before the last letter so this word is murat with a sihari and another reason why bani uses a sihari is if if it has shortened a longer word the actual word is murti the word is murti you know we talk about murti puja we don't say murat puja we say murti puja so the word is murti but bani here has shortened that word poetically for whatever reason but to remind people what the origin of that word is if it had a bihari at the end and bani has removed that so that you should pronounce it as murat bani has retained it as a sihari to show you by the way this word comes from the longer word murti so murti is the longer word which is why it has a sihari but it's also a feminine word so the feminine words also have a sihari there in punjabi grammar we call this istri ling istri ling feminine word the opposite of that is puling which is a masculine word puling masculine istri ling means feminine if this word murat was masculine it would be written with an ankar underneath if this was a masculine word it would be written with an ankar underneath but this masculine word exists in bani as well but it has a completely different meaning this masculine word means moment as in time moment it comes from the longer word which is mahurat so this word comes from mahurat which means moment and you see in bani safal murat safala kadi great is that moment great is that time kadi <coughs> jit sachche naal pyar any moment when you're in love with that great truth when you're in that loving relationship with the great truth that moment is safal is fruitful 
So that's why we know the meaning of Akal Murat doesn't make sense. Because Akal is beyond time, Murat with an Ankar underneath would say time, moment. So that's why we know the meaning of this word can't be this meaning. They would cancel each other out. No time, time won't make sense. But the spelling, just to be clear, Guru Sahibs have given us two completely different spellings. So there's no room for us to make that mistake, to think that there's a possibility. Sometimes you come across words and people say, this word means this or that. So to avoid those misunderstandings, misconceptions, Barney uses different spelling to be very clear. This comes from the word Murti, Akala Murat. This comes from the longer word Mahurat, meaning time. Because I've spelt it like this, you should only translate it as Murti. The other thing you notice is that the word Akal is a masculine word. But the word Akal doesn't have an Ankar underneath it. If you think of the words we've seen so far, Sat Naam, Karta Purk, all have an Ankar underneath. Nirpa, Nirvair, they've all had a, an Ankar underneath it. But Akal doesn't have an Ankar underneath it. And there's another reason for that. In Bani, an Ankar, as well as being masculine, as well as being singular, is also used as a comma. That's why we know when we're pronouncing the Mool Mantra, we know where to stop. That's why we know Sat Naam stops there because it's an Ankur. So it's a comma. Nirpa, comma. Nirvair, comma. If the word Akal had an Ankur underneath it, you'd have to stop and say Akal. You'd have to stop there. How do we know otherwise that these two words are akal and murat? They're two words joined together. How do we know that? How do we know not to just say akal and then murat as a separate word? Because in order to join a masculine word with something else, Bani removes the ankar. It doesn't mean that it's not singular. It doesn't mean that it's not masculine. It means that you have to pronounce it with the next word. Akal Murat. That's how we know to pronounce it Akal Murat. Because Akal should have an Ankar underneath it. But if it did, you'd have to stop there. So, what do we mean by Akal Murat? Remember that every definition in the Mool Mantar is talking about Ik. It isn't a word in its own right, it's an attribute of the Ik. So everything that you have to understand is that it is pointing back to the source, which is Ik. Akal Murat, the Ik cannot be destroyed. The Ik cannot end. The Ik is beyond all destruction. The Ik the oneness destroys everything, but it itself cannot be destroyed. And unlike the demigods of the prevailing mythology of the time, if you think of the mythology of the time, every god has a mother, has been born, and every god has a limited time. But you have to remember that the oneness is above all of this. There is something that is beyond all of this. The problem comes when we apply human characteristics to this oneness. So we think of gods. If we use the word God, we immediately think of a human-like character. <coughs> But there's so many other words that you could use which don't take anything away from it, but at least doesn't 
allow you to fall into the trap of thinking of this oneness like a human character. Th that's the problem with the word God. It's got too many human connotations to it. And then you pray to this God, like there's a He, oh God, why don't you look after me? But change this word to oneness, and then all of a sudden there is no somebody else for you to pray to. There's no other for you to pray to. Because there is only one. It's everywhere. Let's call it energy. Then what are you going to do? Do an ardas to energy. All of a sudden your mind starts wondering, everything that I've learned about this God doesn't work if I change the name. So we've been under a big spell by giving it human characteristics. Let's call it life. Who are you going to pray to? You're going to pray to life. Or are you going to be life? Are you life? You are life. You are energy. In Star Wars they call it the force. And when you watch something like that, you know that it's not talking about a Mr. God. It's force, it's energy. May the force be with you. Even that statement is only a well-wish because the force is always with you. It's in you. Who are you going to pray to? And if it and you are the same thing, then you yourself must be immortal. Because you and it are the same thing. You are life. So a very easy way to understand it is life is immortal. And when you say that, you say, oh, that makes sense. Lives change. A life may be born. A body may be born. And it's given life. But when a bird, an animal, a plant dies, there isn't a bit of life that gets taken away from the whole pot of life. It just merges back into there. When you were in school, what's the first rule that you learned about energy? Energy is not created or destroyed. It simply changes from one state to another. And we can accept that because it makes sense to our mind, it makes sense. Energy isn't created or destroyed. Something with potential energy can move to kinetic energy. So, Barney is saying the same thing here. This is all part of this oneness. There's an energy here. But when you call it God, you create a character, Mr. God. Barney so far hasn't used any imagery to make you think that this is a human-like being. It is said that there is oneness, it is onkar, it is vibration, it is sound, it is energy. So Barney first and foremost tells you, don't make this mistake of thinking of it like a human being. It's energy, it's limitless energy. It's a force, it's a power, it's a shakti. And this force is here, everywhere, doing everything. This is force speaking to force, energy speaking to energy, life speaking to life. And life, whether individual bodies are created or destroyed, the life is unchanged. It just continues. And it is also above time, beyond time. It cannot be changed by time. What is time? How do we understand time? We know time by change. Time and change are linked. So you can look at somebody 
and based on the amount of change, you can tell how much time has passed. From a baby to you, somebody can look at you and say, you must be at least this many units of time old. If you looked like a baby, people will know that for this form, not much time has passed. But if your body has gone through all the various phases of change right to old age, people will see a lot has, of time has passed. They don't know how much time has passed. All they can see is the stages of change from birth to youth, adolescence, adulthood, old age, death. So we're all bound by time. And we see the world in time. We know when something is morning because the day has changed to look like morning. We know when it's midday, when it's almost evening, and when it's night. How do we know? Because something is changing. The sky, the color, the sun, the moon, they're all changing. If you woke up one morning and the sky stood still, and nothing moved in the sky, and the sun stood still, and nothing moved. After a while, you would have no concept of time, because nothing is moving, nothing is changing. And if nothing changed, you would lose all sense of time, because you don't know what, how to assess time when nothing is changing. So Barney is saying here that this thing, this oneness, this energy, this life force, is beyond change. It cannot be changed. It doesn't change from one state to another. It dances around, but there's no change happening. It is beyond time. Change and time give us perspective in the world. That's how we understand the world. But this oneness is eternal. It's beyond it. There is no change, there's no start, there's no end. And if you notice, what does this mean for me? In the present moment also, there is no change happening. You can look at your watch and you can say, I've been sitting here for 10 minutes trying to do some meditation and it doesn't work. But your focus is on time. If your focus was on the present moment, the present moment doesn't actually change. Things around it change, but the moment just slides so gracefully that you can't tell where one moment ends and the next moment begins. And that's how the oneness works. It's just a moment that's changing and evolving and moving. It's moving rather than changing. So in your Simran, try and do Simran in the very present moment where there is nothing but that moment. There is nothing else happening. And in the moment you'll notice that there is no change in the moment. All that there is, is just the presence of the moment itself. And because that moment continues and you know that the moment will never die, you start understanding that this moment is permanent. It's always here. And by moment, I don't mean time. I don't mean this second rather than the next second. I mean the very presence of what's here right now. Your mind is always in the future or in the past, your mind is rarely right in this room, right now. There's an aliveness in this room right now, but your mind is somewhere else. And this aliveness, this moment, is continuous, it's unlimited, it's akal, it's permanent, and it's within you. You don't have to go somewhere else, this aliveness, Life force, energy, oneness is with you. 
So you have to find that permanent within you. Everything else that we identify with is temporary. Everything is temporary. Your body is temporary, yet you identify with it. You say, this is me, this is my body. Seasons change, you identify with it. I don't like when it's raining. Bad weather gets my mood down. I only like sunny weather. So you identify with a temporary. The truth is that the weather inside you is always calm. But you don't associate with the weather inside you. You associate with the temporary weather that in all reality you know will change but still you let it affect you. You know that the season cannot last, but still you're sunny when the weather is sunny, and you're gloomy when the weather is gloomy. So you identify with temporary things. Fashion changes. We identify with looking the way something tells us to. And if you don't fit within that model, then you allow it to affect you. Everybody looks better than I do. I need to look better than everybody else. And if you wore something that was a couple of years out of date, something that was perfectly acceptable five years ago is completely unacceptable today. So you will change your wardrobe to fit what is acceptable today. And something that you find acceptable today, you forget will be completely unacceptable in a few years' time. So why should something that is completely unacceptable in a few years' time give you pleasure now? Because everybody else says it should give you pleasure. Your opinions change. Sometimes you'll have a huge argument with someone because you're holding on to an opinion that says, no, you must never do this. And your understanding of Barney is a particular understanding that exists right now. And you will fight for that understanding and for everybody to understand it the way you do. But in a couple of years' time, you might realize, actually, that was what I thought then. Now I think this, my understanding has changed, my thoughts have changed, my opinions have changed. But do you ever go back and say, I was wrong to fight that fight then? No, because at that time you were so adamant that this is the only way to think. So your thoughts are temporary, don't identify with them. Identify with something that's permanent. Akal, the akal is within you. So identify with something that is beyond these temporary things. <coughs> Money is temporary. Maya and possessions are temporary. Materialism is temporary. Beliefs are temporary. Traditions are temporary. How many times do we fight for tradition? But traditions, the nature of tradition is that they change. Something which wasn't a tradition before becomes tradition. Something that was tradition is no longer acceptable to society, so we lose those traditions. So traditions change. Why do you fight to hold on to traditions? Hold on to nothing, because the seasons are evolving, weather is evolving, life is evolving, nature is evolving, and you must evolve with it. Hold on to nothing. Everything is borrowed. So go beyond everything that's temporary in your life. If you can identify anything that is temporary, don't hold on to it. It's there. Your body is there. Your thoughts are there, but if you can identify that it's temporary, don't associate with it. Don't think that it is worth fighting for.
don't think it is worth holding on to. So hold on to everything that is immortal. And when you try and find everything that's immortal, you'll find that you can't find many things. Everything is temporary. So what do you hold on to? All of these things that you're holding on to are going to die, so you might as well kill them now. Kill them in the sense that your attachment to them should be killed. Your association with them should be killed. And that applies to your body, to your thoughts. Give everything a death and know that everything that will die, allow it to die now so that you can truly live. So how is this achieved? How do we do this? Sounds good. What do we need to do to start living like this? The first thing you need to do is to identify what are these temporary things in my life. So everything that has a kaal, everything that has some form of kaal, some form of death, let's identify it. Let's do a little exercise. If I ask you, tell me, who are you? Who are you? What you find is when I probe that question, you gave me everything that you understand yourself to be. So you start by saying, I am a man, I am a woman, my name is such and such. And then I say, okay, I'm not interested in that, tell me more. I say, okay, I'm a PE teacher, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, not interested in that, tell me more. Okay, I'm a Man United supporter, okay, I'm a Chelsea supporter, good, tell me more. Okay, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a non-vegetarian, good, tell me more. Okay, I'm a father, I'm a mother, tell me more, I'm a brother. I'm a sister, I have this many brothers and sisters. Tell me more. And what you start doing is you start giving me everything that you know about yourself. You start throwing it out there. And these are all the temporary things in your life. And what is it that you've done? From the day that you were born, you started collecting these things. So you start building a wall around you of all these things that you know about yourself. And the foundation of this wall is built with certain bricks that cannot move. So I am man, I am woman. That's a brick that this, the rest of this wall is built on. That brick can't change. That's permanent. That brick is staying there. I am born into a Sikh family. Do what you want, that's never going to change. That's a solid bit of identity that cannot change. Then you start building on things like your name. My name was this when I was born, I was given this name. Every other name that you call me will not take away from the fact that this is who I am. So you, let's build a wall around us of the absolute permanent things. And then you start building what we think are permanent, by the way. They're not really permanent, but we think they're permanent. This is the permanent wall around us. Nothing's going to change the fact that I'm male or I'm female. That's a given. Nothing's going to change that I'm of Indian, Asian complexion. That's a given. Or I'm white or I'm black. That's a given. Nothing's going to change that. I might try to disguise it, but I can't change it. So that's a given. Then I start building things on that aren't so solid as those foundations. So, when you were younger, one of the bricks that you had of your identity was I was a student, I am a student. But at one point that brick got taken off and another brick got placed in its, in its place. So I'm no longer a student, I can take that brick and discard that one, I will never be that brick again. I am now a lawyer, doctor, fill in the blank. You were at one point a child. 
at some point, that identity merged into the adult identity. So you take the child brick away and say, I'm no longer a child, I'm an adult. At one point, you could have said, I was, uh, I was an only child. But then my younger brother or sister was born. So I was no longer an only child, I'm now a brother or a sister. At one point, you were single, and then you got married. So you replace one brick with another, saying, the single brick is gone, I'm now the married identity. And when the husband or the wife moves on, then that identity goes. I'm no longer married. I'm no longer in a relationship. I'm now back to being single again. I put that brick back. We start building our identity. I am this. I am that. I'm a PE teacher. Tomorrow you might not be a PE teacher. You might be something else. So you start building a wall around you of all the things that you hold on to. And then there's more temporary things. I like blue. I don't like green. That's a trivial one. You might think, oh, there's some power in this color and that color, but it's nothing more than an identity. The color doesn't care about you, but you care about the color. So I like blue. That's my, I'm, a, I'm a blue person. I like the cold weather. Now, I'm not a cold person. I'm a sunny person. So you start building this wall around you. And soon the wall starts getting quite high. I am a this and I am a that. And in, in reality, if I keep probing you, you're going to keep throwing, showing me these bricks. Look, this is one of mine. That's one of mine. That's one of mine. This is mine. I am a this, I am a that. I am a this, I am a that. You start building this huge wall around you until you've completely encapsulated yourself in this wall. And this entire wall is my identity. And then when somebody asks you, who am I? You start with the lower bricks. Yep, I'm, I'm that person. All right, who are you? I'm that person, I'm that person, I'm that person. In reality, you won't actually run out. It's quite a big fortress that you've built around you. And this entire fortress, we've given it a name, I. So, in order to become immortal, you have to identify every single one of these bricks and say, yep, I can see that that's a temporary brick. I am alive is also a temporary identity. I am this body. All the other bricks might change, but the body stays with you for your whole life. It's yours. It stays with you. But you know, from a very young age, you know that that's a temporary brick. Imagine the very wall that you've been building around you is based on a foundation that's loose. But we don't think it's loose. We go on deluding ourselves that the foundation bricks that we've laid around us are permanent. They're not going anywhere. But you know they're not permanent. In reality, you know this entire fortress is going to come crashing down one day. And that's called death. When every single thing that you've held on to... Remember, this wall around you isn't held by some solid cement. It's held by thousands of arms of yours just saying, mine, 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 I'm holding on to that one. I don't want to let that one go. I'm not letting that one go. That's mine, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. Imagine a million arms around you just holding on to all of these little bricks and saying, no, you can't have that one. Okay, you can have that one. I don't want to be the Man United supporter anymore. They lost very badly in blah, blah game. I'll now be this guy. I don't want to associate with them anymore. So you let certain ones go, but you don't let certain things go. No, I'm never going to be this person. I'm a good person. That's a good, that's a good brick to hold on to. How many of us have that brick? How many of us hold on to the brick that says, I'm a bad person? Some of us do. I'm a terrible person. I'm a really bad person. That's a good brick to hold on to as well. But remember, that's just another brick to hold on to. And all of these bricks build up this fortress around you, and that's our identity. What is Guru Nanak Dev Ji saying? All of those arms that are holding on, let them all go. And when you let them all go, you get very scared. What am I letting go of? What am I letting go of? I can let go of some things, I'll give you some things, but what, you want me to let go of the fact that I'm alive? 
You want me to let go of that? That's the one brick that you want to hold on to more than anything else. Change anything about me. I'll give you any other brick. Even if you want to change me from male to female, I'll give you that. But don't take this brick away from me. I am alive. Don't take that one away from me. And that's the one Guru Nanak Dev Ji wants you to let go of. I am. I am of value. I deserve to be here. Take anything away from me, but don't take my own life. Or you hold on to the loved ones. You're holding on to not only your bricks, but you're also holding on to one arm is reaching out and holding on to somebody else's fortress. My husband, my wife, my children. You can say, break my wall down, kill me, but don't, don't break this one. That wall is even more precious than my wall. Why is it precious? The only thing that makes it precious to you is that one arm that's gone there and holding on to that one, saying, that one's mine. Do whatever you want, that one's mine. Some arms are shorter and closer to you, some arms are further away, say, okay, you can have that one. You didn't know yourself to be this architect of such a great fortress. Barney uses the word body fortress. You come across sometimes in the translation. I've built a mansion around me. You've built this mansion around you, fine. But if I was to take every single brick away from you, every single one, what would be left? Every brick. Instinctively, you would say nothing will be left. If you take everything, every single brick if I take away from you, you will say nothing will be left. I'll say, no, that's not true. Barney says, no, that's not true. The one that was holding on to all of them is still there. And the one that's holding on to all of them is permanent. Whose arms was it that's holding on to all these things? Barney's saying, let go of all those bricks and embrace the one that's holding on to all of those bricks. Imagine an eye that holds on to nothing. It just is. I am. Not, I am male, I am female. I like this and I like that. You know, this is what we do. We also have friends. What is a friend? Somebody that I'm holding on to. What's an enemy? One brick that I'm trying to break away. This is a bad one. You're punching with one arm and you're holding on to with the other arm. This is my friend. What are your likes and your dislikes? Things that you hold on to? Even your dislike is something that you're holding on to. Did you know that? A dislike is also another arm reaching somewhere. Saying, I dislike you, I dislike you, I dislike you, and I'm going to continue disliking you. If you dislike them, let them go. Why hold on to them? It's like holding on to someone saying, go away, go away, go away. But you're holding on to them at the same time. I dislike you, I dislike you, I dislike you. Well, let go of them then. This is what we do. But there is something inside that brick wall that's holding on to all of them, and that is life. Life that has no brick to say what name it is, no brick to say what gender it is, no brick to say what it likes, what it dislikes. I am a this, I am a that. I only do part like this, and I don't do this type of part. I only follow this mariada and I don't follow that mariada. Don't be fooled. All of these things are attachments. Be attached to the one who has the ability to be attached to things. The one doing the attaching, see that one. The light inside the house that's switched on, that's the one that you need to look at. Manatu Jot Sarupaha, you are light. Recognize yourself. What do you recognize? You just look at all the bricks. Everything that the light is shining onto, that's what you look at. I am this and I'm that. Am I still a man? Yeah, I'm still a Man United supporter. That one's not moving. 
Am I? Mm, I'm not sure. I thought I thought I liked this, but I'm not so sure anymore. That one's not too sure. Everything that the light is shining onto. Imagine a room with a light bulb in the middle of the room, and the whole time the light bulb is just looking at all the pretty things in the room. That's nice curtains. That's a really nice carpet. That could do with changing. I don't like that so much. That window is a little bit dirty. That's a very nice painting on the wall. The light bulb spends its whole life looking at everything around you, saying, oh, that could do with a bit of a clean, that could do with that, that's good, that's not so good. But it never recognizes that it's a light bulb. That because of it being on, all these things exist. Because the light is switched on, only because it is alive, can it shine light on all these things? Can it see what the body is? Can it see what the mind is doing? Can it see opinions? Can it see friends and family? You don't recognize that you're the light bulb in the room. All you recognize are the pretty pictures on the wall. This is me. Don't I look good today? How much time do we spend polishing the brick walls and making sure that this foundation dusting out the cobwebs, making sure this foundation stays good. What about the light bulb, which is on at the moment? Or is it on? Is it a very dim light? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's a very dim light at the moment. No, it's not dim at all. It can't be dim. It's either on or it's off. The fact that you're alive means there's a light bulb on. You are Jyot Sarup. All of this stuff is temporary. And when you sit in your meditation, you should be the light bulb within you. Just be the life that's alive within you and don't be the bricks. Don't associate with the bricks. Don't associate my body. I've got to do this today. Oh, I can't believe what my mum said to me. I can't believe what this person did. I really like what that person did. That's again associating with the temporary rather than associating with the permanent. That life, believe it or not, is always on. It's akal. It's within you. It's not Mr. God is beyond time. You say, well, that's good for you, mate. You're beyond death, but I'm, I've only got, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 years to live. I better get, get on with it. I better do everything that I need to, because you might be unlimited, but I'm... I'm you know, I'm only here for a short time. That's how we think. Duality. Barney's saying, no, you are unlimited. Not the bricks that you hold on to, but the one holding. The one alive. Aliveness within you. So in order to become Akal, first thing you have to do is identify all the temporary things. And I don't mean literally every single brick. Otherwise, you're going to waste your time. You're going to be the person that counts all the bricks. That's just another identity that you're holding on to. So identify the kaal within you, and then let it go. You know, in most spiritual traditions, including the original Khalsa tradition, as soon as you're initiated into a spiritual path, you get given a new name. Even the Kundalini yogis do the same thing. When somebody becomes initiated into that tradition, they get given a yogi name. And Guru Gobind Singh Ji did the same thing. When the Khalsa was created, they got given a name. Why is that so? It's not that you now put another brick on your fortress, say, I used to be this guy, now I'm this guy, Mr. Big Shot. It's not for that. It's to remind you that none of these bricks are real. None of these bricks are permanent. So your name is one of those permanent ones that Guru takes. What's the other permanent brick that the Guru wanted you to give in order to be initiated, being alive? Guru said, give me your head. Are you willing to break that most permanent of bricks? Because only when you're willing to break that one does your spiritual path begin. If you want to play this game of love, come to me with your head. So are you willing to let go of the most important brick that you hold on to? I am alive. 
Guru Gobind Singh Ji says, get rid of that. Guru Nanak Dev Ji says, get rid of that. I am alive. I'm something. My body is here. I am this guy. How many guys have you been? How many girls have you been? You don't know. How many animals have you been? You don't know. So even I am this guy or I am this girl is a temporary one because it's been something else before. It's just a light bulb in a different room. Now you might call that reincarnation, call that soul, call it whatever you want. But your body is a temporary one. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is saying, chop that off. Let's get rid of that one. Don't hold on to anything. And when you get given a spiritual name, <coughs> what that spiritual path is trying to teach you is even that can be changed. So even that is temporary. It's allowing you to start breaking this wall around you. Start knocking those bricks over. And the way you do it is by letting go. Letting go of the cement that's holding on to them. The cement is you holding on to them. Don't hold on to anything. And it's a reminder. When you get given a new name, Singh, Kaur, whatever it is, when you get given a new name, it's a reminder, don't hold on to anything, even your name can be changed. Nothing in nature stays the same. You know, even in your body, your cells don't stay the same. No one cell in your body has been around for more than about three or four months. Every cell in your body regenerates dies and regenerates every 120 days or something like that, 180 days, something like that. So this thing that you call I actually isn't you. 180 days ago, there was no cell in your body that exists in your body now. So who is this I that you're holding on to? It's not what you think it is. So, how do you let go? How do you open the hands that are, for the last 20, 30, 40 years, holding on so tight, digging in so tight to your body, to your mind, to your thoughts, to your beliefs, to your bricks of identity? It doesn't have to be a painful process. It doesn't have to be a painful process. You simply have to transcend it. If you look at a child, think about a young child, and they have a favorite toy. When they have that favorite toy, it is their whole world to them. They wake up in the morning, and they think about that toy. Quick, where's that gone? Where's that toy? They go to sleep at night, and that's their safety blanket. They hold on to that toy. But you'll notice in a couple of months, in a couple of years, that toy eventually gets left at the back of a cupboard somewhere. And after some time, they stop thinking about that toy. And eventually they'll grow up and all their toys will get left behind. And when that child becomes an adult, they haven't done anything painful. They've simply transcended that attachment. That's all they've done. They've transcended. And when they look as an adult at small children holding on to toys, they laugh at them and say, well, that's what children do. It's a temporary thing. So all that that child has done is transcended those toys. He's moved, he's evolved and said, I haven't done anything painful. I've simply let them go. I was attached to them and I'm no longer attached to them. And in the same way, you have to transcend all those bricks that you're holding on to. You simply have to let go. It doesn't have to be a painful thing like getting your head chopped off. How many times you will find people who are very gentle, very good-natured, very humble people, but you don't see them for a while and they come back and you see them and they've taken Amrit and they're not that same person anymore. They're not so kind anymore. Why? 
because they've taken a big brick and placed it right at the top of their fortress. It's like a crown jewel. And they said, I'm not one of you plebs anymore. I'm super guy. I'm this guy. It's like they've become a superhero or something. And then they'll look down at every single one of you. Why aren't you a superhero like me? Why aren't you an Amritari like me? Why aren't you doing your nitanim? What have they done? They've put this big bar on their head that says, I am great. I am no longer a Manmuk. I am a Gurmuk. If you're a Gurmuk, you have no bricks to hold on to. You don't just go and add another one on. So Amrit can be taken as another identity. Where you were supposed to lose identity, you've gained an identity. Where you were supposed to give your head, you've not given anything, you've taken more on. You can replace one toy with another toy. Amritaris can look down on people and say, oh, look at you, Maya Taris. You're holding on to Maya. And yet they hold on to their Sarablo Kare and their Sarablo Shastar and their traditions and I am a Bibeki and I am a this and I only eat out of this and I only wake up at this sort of time. What have they done? They've simply replaced some bricks with another brick. Barney is trying to teach you no attachment is worth holding on to. And so all that they've done is redecorated their room. And where the room used to have hair cut, now it has long hair. Where the room used to go to the cinema and the clubs and drinking before it now goes to the Gurdwara and it does Kirtan sessions instead of clubbing sessions. Have they done anything better? You only do something better when you let go. That is the Gursik, one who lets go. Manka man tyago. Get rid of the I am great mentality. Man, I am great. I am something special. This is me. And I'm not knocking Amrit. The Amrit is beautiful. It's you who's not realized that it's not just something to hold on to, it's something to let go of. Amrit is the rust that you taste when you've let go of things. Otherwise you become even more egotistical. It's sad to see extremely egotistical Amritaris. Holier than thou. We all know them. We all know people who say, you know what, I actually don't like hanging around with you anymore. You were all right before you took Amrit. But now you're something else. The Amrit isn't at fault. You've not understood what the Amrit was supposed to do. You've simply replaced one brick with another brick. You've just redecorated your fortress. You've not given your head. So it's very important that we learn how to give these bricks away. One of the most important things to give away is I am looking for God. That's just another brick. Even that's another brick. It's like the light bulb saying I'm looking for the light bulb. Isn't that insane? Imagine a light bulb who switched on, spends his whole life walking around asking everyone, where's light, where's light? And everyone says, I don't know. Why? Why don't they know? Because when you are a light bulb and you've surrounded yourself with these bricks, nobody else can see it. Nobody else can see light and you can't even see light. So when you look at someone, all you see is the brick wall that they've created. It's a brick wall looking at a brick wall. Two brick walls looking at each other and both asking, where's the light? One says, I don't know. The other one says, I don't know. I've never seen it. I've heard about it. Recognize your own light. Recognize that you are light and not the brick wall. 
not only will you see your light, you'll see every other person's light. There's a great scene in the Matrix movie. You know what I mean? Which, 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 if you've seen the all three movies, at the end, when he merges, what does he see? He sees himself as light, and all that he can see around you is light. Some of these movies, we might laugh at them and say, okay, yeah, it's just a movie. But actually, a lot of these movies have taken their inspiration from quite ancient traditions, quite spiritual traditions. And if you know, you can look at them and say, I can see what, what they're coming to, where that's come from. Don't be afraid to use these as analogies. In the Guru's times, they used the stories that were prevalent of the time, and they used sakis and stories of gods and demons and whatever. Today, these are stories that we understand. So if I say it's like the Force from Star Wars, I'm not doing a biadabi of Barney, of God, or anything like that. I'm simply using an analogy to say if you don't understand this, understand that. But the easiest analogy I can give you is you are the light bulb within the room and you've not seen that, that you're a light bulb. What is Guru then? Guru is nothing more than a big mirror. Guru shines a big mirror in front of you and say, ah, now I can see it. If you study the Guru, if you read the Guru's message, if you practice the Guru's way, the Guru is a mirror showing you what you are. It places a mirror in front of all the bricks and says, forget those, they're there. Focus on your own light. When you know your own light, you will know the God that you've been searching for. And let go of the brick that says, I'm looking for God. The light bulb that's looking for light needs to just look at itself and find the bit within it that is not temporary. Many of us think that all the things that we want to achieve in our life are eventualities rather than possibilities. We like to think of them as just a matter of time and it'll happen. But the truth of the matter is, you could walk out of this building today and it could all be over. Nobody knows when a big sledgehammer is going to come and just knock everything down. It's not going to ask your permission. There's a king who went to a holy man and he said, teach me about God. How do I learn about this? And the holy man said, come to my house and stay with me for one night. And the king agreed, and he visited the holy man's house, and he was very well greeted, given nice meals and some entertainment, and they had a very good time together. And when it was time to sleep, the, the king was taken to the guest room, and he looked around, and yeah, looks Looks like a nice, comfortable room. I think I should be able to sleep well. He got changed, lied down on his bed, lay flat, and he looked up. And hanging there with a very thin piece of string was a big, sharp knife hanging, just swinging above his head, barely hanging on. And the next morning, for breakfast, the holy man says, I hope you had a comfortable night. Did you sleep well? And the king got very angry. He said, no, I didn't sleep well. 
Everything was fine. There was a nice comfortable bed. I had everything I needed. But how can I sleep with that thing hanging above my head? And the holy man said that if you want to know about God, remember that there is a knife hanging over your head and at any moment it can drop. If you knew at any moment, even right now sitting here, for no reason whatsoever your life can end right now, and it's happened. People die all the time completely unexpectedly. Clean bill of health and they die. Because death is hanging over every single one of our heads and at any moment it can drop and it can completely smash that entire fortress of ours. If you knew that that was the case, how would you live differently? If you knew that the next moment wasn't going to be yours, you'd really take care of what you're doing in this moment, where your mind is going, what you're thinking of. You wouldn't spend all of your time thinking about what you could do in 10 years' time, or the shopping that needs to be done, or have I switched the heating off at home? Did I remember to turn the gas off? If you knew that the next moment wasn't coming, you'd really want to hold on to this moment. And that's what meditation is. That's what Simran is. When you meditate, even using your breath as a meditation, you should inhale not expecting the exhale to come out. And when you exhale and you put a nam to that exhale, Whatever the naam is that you use, let's say it's Wahiguru. You say Wahiguru and not expecting that there is a next inhale to allow you to do another breath. Say that one Wahiguru as if it was the only Wahiguru you ever had to say. Say that naam at the very edge of death. Simran. Meditation at the very edge of death. And be comfortable with that death know that in that very moment the universe is in perfection right now. If you don't get to achieve what you want to in your life, the universe isn't incomplete in any way. There's no imbalance. Meditate, Nam Simran, on the very edge of death, as though the very next breath you are going to fall off. And if you fell off, it's okay, because that very last breath that you had you did it in absolute completion. Jivat Mare. Barney talks about being dead while alive. That is Akal. When you are so willing for the next moment for death to come and take you, that death loses the joy in taking you. Death's only job, his only enjoyment in life is to, is to take people's life. When he reaches a Brahmgyani, he says, the swad is gone. This person has already given up life. This person has already died. I have nothing to take from this person. Become such a Gursik that death has nothing to take from you Death will come and namaskar at your feet. Meditate so willing to die, so happy. Jab av ki od nidhan bane athi ran me tab juj maro. When that moment comes and I'm on the battlefield, I will die absolutely willingly happily. I will greet death with open arms. To a Khalsa, death is their closest ally. Death is the Khalsa's best friend. Because the Khalsa knows all the temporary things can go at any time. At any time all those bricks can be broken. The Khalsa isn't afraid to let his door open to death because he's lost his attachment to all of his identity, to
to all of those bricks, he's lost his identity. And when you've lost that identity and you're so willing to let these things go, and so happy to give your head, because your head is also just another one of these bricks, then you become a Kali. That's why the Khalsas were called Akalis, immortals. Akalis come from ones who themselves have become Akal. <laughs>